Today, I'm going to talk about how to present medical scientific papers in English. As you know, English is very important for scholars because English is the powerful international language in academia. Now, English is not the language only for Americans or British people. It is also for Costa Rican, Mexican, and Argentines, and also uh, Ecuadorian and Koreans. So needless to say, the better your English, the greater the opportunities for academic growth you will have. I'd like to divide my talk into seven topics. So I'd like to start with the first part. Here are four hints for presentation. As you know, a slide is very important tool between the speakers and audience. To make a good presentation, please remember that Keep <clears throat> keep data and tables on slide simple, meaning limit your slide to more than seven lines and seven words or less per line. Do not use red, green, or purple for background or letters, and do not include too much information. Instead, Limit your presentation to key points and leave the fine details for publication. By the way, uh, how many of you think this slide uh, would say is well designed? Dr. Saladan, do you think this is well designed? Well, it does. I think it does keep to your recommendations. It mm -hmm. says, uh, less than seven lines, well, mm -hmm. seven, eight, I think. Um, it, I think it's it's okay, maybe. Yeah, I okay. think it's okay. No Any other opinions? <laughs> Any other opinions? Okay. What about this? This is the same content, but design is different. This is better, right? Yeah, that looks, that looks better. Yeah, that looks better. Yeah, less lines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yes. uh, I'll go. I'll go back to the previous slide. Uh, this is the pre previous slide. <clears throat> you can see uh, there are two lines for number two and number three hints each. And also the second line has a total of 10 words. But again, let's move forward. <clears throat> uh, the second line uh, uh, is less than seven words. So please keep in mind, keep it short and simple. So they is an acronym, acronym, it's a KISS. What about this slide? Just a look at the color for background and the letters. You can see a purple color for background and red and green for letters. It gives you a headache, isn't it? Right? So I'd like to introduce a funny story. I gave a talk on the hints for oral presentation at Osaka City University in Japan, 2004. And I used this slide for bad example. And all of a sudden, all the people left altogether. I didn't understand why they were laughing. So after my lecture was over, I asked one of the audience, why did you laugh during my presentation? He said, this style of uh, slide is my 
both Chairman's favorite. So he has consistently used that type of slide longer than 10 years. As you know, in Japan, the chairman's power is very strong. What he or she said goes. That's why they left. Uh, but anyway, uh, that was a funny story. After that, they, he didn't use this kind of slide anymore because I met him personally. What about this slide? It's difficult to read. That, yeah, okay. that's very true. That's very true <laughs> what it says there. If you have a very nice picture, people don't read the, the, the text. They, they look at the picture. That's true. This is my style because it is short and simple. Again, the audience will be interested in your content because there is no beautiful photos and unnecessary things. So they can concentrate on your content. That's why I like this kind of a simple and short slide. And then I'd like to show you several slides designed by a fellow at Utasca in San Antonio. As I mentioned before, I set up a um, interventional research meeting in San Antonio. That meet, meeting included the authorship conference and also the rehearsal before their presentation of scientific papers at the national or international meeting. Uh, Dr. Sophia Gamboa, you are on the line? No? No, to, doc, no today Dr. Song, she couldn't uh, join the meeting. She, okay. she sent me a message before. Uh, you are, uh, anyone from Argentina, Buenos Aires? No? Oh, uh, no one? Probably no, not all? today. Not today, Dr. Song. Okay. Okay. Anyway, um, uh, what do you think about this slide? This is a background slide. So I will explain. They classified splenic injuries uh, in five grades according to the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma Splenic Injury Scale. What do you think about this slide? This is okay? And I, any I, I, would, I, would, I would think that, like for example, my opinion would be that, uh, that uh, I would make the, the, um, the image larger so you could see the, the captions. Okay, how can you make it? And you have a, a, lo a lot of text. Yes. I would make the, the image larger, larger, like maybe make it bigger, maybe almost half of the slide. And the splenic injuries, like all this text is not really necessary. I think it says too much information. Uh, Melissa is, is her opinion about this one. She says that uh, the background is confusing with the image uh -huh. and oh. that it doesn't seem, that you can't see it very well. So she says that. Uh, I agree with you. The content of a slide should be able to comprehend it in 20 seconds, but it's impossible because the uh, slides and letters are too small. So I gave the speaker, the fellow, two options. One is this one, like the, I asked him to just write the title of the presentation because this is the background. So the title was a distal glue embolization in the setting of splenic trauma. So as Dr. Seredo mentioned, I made the picture bigger. Uh, I can explain this one easily. So we classified the splenic injury scale into five grades according to the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma. For example, grade one is less than 10%, grade two between 10 to 50% and grade three, more than 50% 
surface area. Grade four, a pseudo aneurysm or AV fissure, and grade five, vascular injury and active bleeding. This is better, right? Any other comments or questions? This is okay. This is my first option. What could be the my second option? Um, what, I, I, what about word? Can you take out the word background? The uh, word background. <laughs> could you take it out? Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, uh, we can take out, take the black background out. But uh, I didn't it because I couldn't manage the whole thing. That's why I just made the liked one, but that is a good idea. Okay, that is my second option. I split the five pictures into two, like uh, this is a bigger, same, and then this is the one. So uh, this is uh, his example case, I will explain. The contrast in abdominal CT shows uh, splenic laceration extending to the hilum and also uh, hemoperitoneum surrounding the spleen and the liver. And angiography shows two pseudo aneurysms at the lower four of the spleen and we, they performed glue embolization. After embolization, the venous phase shows a defect because of the glue embolization with no further filling of the pseudo aneurysm. And post embolization abdominal CT shows low density in the spleen due to embolization, and this is a glue, and there was no. Uh, pseudo aneurysm. How would you uh, revise or redesign this uh, case, example case? Dr. Seredon? Okay, uh, well, um, there's a lot of text in all of them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, for example, this one, the uh, this, like, one. Uh, this one, yeah, the, 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 the blue, the blue text, mm -hmm. you can't even. Read yeah, you can it's see terrible. It, sure. Blue <laughs> arrows, you can't even see it. That is definitely I wrong. Agree with you. That's terrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a lot of Any other opinion? So we uh, don't have to have all this information. Uh, yeah. I cannot hear you because okay. of the delay or slow, but anyway. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's it's when you when you, when you change uh, the um, slides, there's a, a small lag. But um, I would I would uh, make the pictures larger. I would okay. uh, probably reduce uh, as much as I could the explanation because you can mention that you can say okay. that. Sure, sure, definitely. And Doctor Alfa. And uh, mm, okay, the continue. arrows are fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Alfaro, what's your opinion? Um, I think I'll keep the arrows too, but mm -hmm. maybe I'll put like uh, just um, a word, uh, maybe like splenic laceration and red arrow. That's enough. Mm -hmm. And yeah. hemoperitoneum, um, orange arrow, enough. Because they're supposed that you, you really know this uh, image by heart. So mm -hmm. you don't have to show sure. the text. You're able to explain it. Okay, so good. I, I'll do that. Just two words. That's enough. Okay. Any other comments or opinion? No? Okay. Uh, I'll give you my uh, comment. I redesign like this. This is very simple. Just one uh, slide. I can briefly explain. Pre-embolization, uh, abdominal CT shows splenic laceration extending to the hilum and hemoperitoneum surrounding the spleen and the river. 
And uh, angiography shows two aneurysms, the aneurysms which was treated by glue embolization. Post embolization uh, abdominal CT shows uh, glue materials with no further filling of the pseudo aneurysm. So uh, because this is an example case, you can compare pre and post angio and sit together. That's why I'd like to have one slide to show the example case. But anyway, there are different kinds of opinions. This is not uh, one solution. This is usually I designed the slide. So when we present the paper, as I mentioned before, the a slide is very important communication between speakers and audience. So you have to think about the audience, not yourself, because we present the paper for audience, not for myself. This, that's why you have to think about from the audience point of view. That is my idea. And then this is a slide for conclusion. It will be easy for you to give a comment. Any other comment for this conclusion slide? Um, I was going to mention that uh, for the previous one, um, Melissa Solano commented that the text was too mm -hmm. I think that's probably what she would say on this one too. It's, uh, I, would have, I would think the same here. It's, uh, there's a lot of space, of empty space. Uh -huh. Does it make sense to have sure, such a sure. small phrase and have so much space so you could make it... Uh, a lot larger, I think. So you may maybe okay. increase the, the size of the text, maybe less less information. Uh, okay. Let me let me read it. While infrequently utilized glue embolization. <laughs> well, yeah, glue embolization. Yeah, he can take out while infrequently used. Just take out glue embolization can be an effective tool. That's that's mm -hmm. a good conclusion. And maybe use bullet points. Maybe okay. glue embolization can be an effective tool and current outcomes appear similar to those reported in the literature, something like that. Okay. Just those. Okay, Dr. Vanessa Montano, what's your opinion? About this slide of conclusion? Yes, conclusion slide. Do you like yeah, it? it? No, I don't like it because the <laughs> letters are too small and you should uh, separate one sentence, another sentence. Mm -hmm. um, I think will be better. <laughs> okay, good. For my so, opinion. Yeah, you are right. The letters are too small to read. And each yes. line has more than seven words. That was my answer. So I redesigned like this one. Yes. This is much better, right? And I then like also I uh, put just the title because this is a conclusion. Anyway, there are different kind of uh, technique and method to improve the design of a slide and the presentation skill. So please try to make a, a meeting for rehearsal before their presentations because residents, they don't know how to handle the slides. Uh, that's why uh, I really recommended that if you have time, tr please try to make a meeting for uh, rehearsal. Anyway, I'd like to move on to the second topic, do's and don'ts. Here are three do's before the meeting. Try to make balance your presentation in a logical sequence. For example, you can divide your presentation into purpose, materials and methods, result and conclusion, as you would in writing scientific papers. And also I want you to write your presentation to practice in, with a critic in front of your colleagues, as I mentioned just before. And needless to say, the more you practice and edit your presentation, the better you will be at it. Uh, here are four do's at the meeting. 
Uh, it's important to visit your presentation room in advance to get a feel for how the controls and the computer work. And I want you to meet the chairman to introduce yourself because it's important to be comfortable with the chairman's English, like uh, Korean English or British English, Spanish English, uh, because the chairman will repeat the question when you don't understand the question. And also try to face audience and maintain eye contact. This is not easy for beginners, but this is very important. Many people just look at the slide or they just don't look at the audience. Sometimes they look at the ceilings and the windows, but that is not a good idea because you have to try to read the audience mind. Sometimes you can miss uh, that the audience lose the interest in your presentation. So if you think they are not interested in, probably you can speak up or you can just uh, uh, speak fast. And uh, also you must keep the allotted time for your presentation. This is must. If it is uh, seven minutes, you have to keep the seven minutes. Uh, as I mentioned, visiting your presentation room in advance is very important. I always visit my presentation room. For example, this is RSNA conference. It's 2,000 people attended the meeting. I'm sorry, 60,000 people attended the meeting, but there's a big conference room, including 5,000. So you can understand the size of the meeting room. This is a small one. Uh, this was in the United States at Duke University. And then uh, you can understand the controls of print uh, the um, computers and also mouse and laser point and where the microphones are and also how loud they are. So this is very important. If you don't know the size of the room, probably uh, you will be uh, nervous because that was your first time to see this kind of a big auditorium. Here are three don'ts at the meeting. Do not abuse the laser point. Uh, particularly the beginners, they don't turn off the laser point. So they abuse the laser point and the mouse uh, like this and the circle and then follow this one every time. So try to use it to indicate your target briefly. So if you are Slide is like this, you don't need to use a uh, mouse. Probably you can just uh, here. And then uh, do not rush, speak slow and clearly. This is very important for non-native speakers because if the non-native speakers rush and speak fast, they don't understand. Why? Because the intonation and the accents are different. And do not be afraid of the question. Easier said than done. This is not easy for beginners, but that's true. Uh, it is true that they do not know about your study as much you do. So if you worried about uh, the questions, uh, I'd like to ask you to uh, meet the chairman and ask possible questions to the chairman because the chairman usually prepare two or three uh, questions for each speakers. So it's okay to ask. And then uh, try not to be afraid of questions, but rather anticipate them because um, uh, you are there to teach 
your experience and to present your experience. So just do it. Uh, try not to be afraid of the questions. And then also some questions are very, very important for your next idea. So you can anticipate or waiting for the questions. Uh, this is an analysis of 221 questions given to me at international meeting, particularly RSNA. I have attended the RSNA 13 times in law. And then here you can see 55% of the questions are related with the materials and method. 32% are the, related with the result. In other words, you know the answer, 87%, because that is your result. So it is very important to write your manuscript before you uh, present your papers, because uh, when you finish writing papers, you understand the everything, including the background and also previous uh, references. That's why uh, I really want you to finish writing your papers before you present uh, your papers. After returning home, after presentation, there should be good questions. And then you can revise your manuscript one more time according to the um, audience feedback. And then you can submit it. That is uh, my way. So there is no need to be overly concerned with the questions. Even if you don't know the answer, it is okay. Just to do your best. So if the questions become a really concern, preparing answers for potential questions is a good strategy, I will explain. This was my slide for my presentation at 2017 Korean Radiological Society. That was seven minute presentations followed by three minute questions. We present uh, papers in English 100%. That's why we had to present in English. Here you can see I prepared 10 slides for seven minute presentation. And also here you can see uh, my answers for eight possible questions, particularly the discussion section. So this is my uh, possible answers. And also there were three questions during three minutes for discussion. And then the first one, you remember that I talked about the uh, eustachian tube balloon dilation, that was my idea. So that's, that I had three questions pre from the audience. The clinical meaning of the enlarged bony canal, that was discussion part. And the other one, look at the possibility of infection due to balloon dilation. That was a result. And also, is it okay to advance the guide wire into the middle ear space? That was a material and method. So I like this kind of uh, question. And I usually write down the questions from the audience because it is good and helpful for my next presentations. And also I can get ideas from the questions. That's why every time I attend the international meeting, I make a note uh, after presentation. And I'd like to move on to the next topic, how to present a scientific paper in English. Uh, I confirm that all of you keep my template. And then uh, it has been my habit to take a note whenever I came across useful English expressions at the international conferences, because my native tongue is not English. That's why after returning home, I asked my English teacher or my American friend whether my uh, note were correct or not. After that, I saved the note into my computer. So 
this all of the examples are from the meeting. So this is very practical and approved by uh, American friends. So you can use these expressions uh, if you need. And then, uh, uh, for example, recently it is very important to disclose your financial interest regarding your paper or off-label use of a device. So here, is, here are three examples. For example, I will dis discuss off-label use of a device. I have nothing to disclose financially. I am an owner of the patent. I have a grant or royalty from a company. So it is obligatory to reveal that the relationship between your presentation and the company. Uh, it's okay, but the audience should know. And then I am a consultant for a company and I am a committee member on the board of a company. And also, here's another example. Could you turn off the light, please? Usually, when you start the presentation, you can use this one, particularly the first presenter, because the, uh, the, it is too uh, bright for your presentation. But this is wrong. How would you correct this expression? Could you turn off the light, please? Or turn the light off, please? Why this is long? Um, because you're asking for something, you're not giving an, um, a command. <laughs> okay, this is order. Okay. And any other, any, anything else? English itself is um, okay. Maybe so. Could we? Yeah, I think the, the English is okay. I think, but like you could, could we? Uh, like, could, could we get the lights, please? Maybe faster. Could we get the lights? Something like that, please. Maybe more colloquial, okay. more informal. Okay. But this is the answer. Here you can say, "Could you dim the lights, please? Lights down, please, or dim the lights, please." Turn the lights down, please. Why? Because they don't turn off the lights. Usually dim the lights or down the lights, right? If you, they turn off the light, it's too <laughs> dark. And also there is not only one light. There are many lights in the auditorium. That's why this is correct. But they can understand if you say, could you turn off the light, please? They can do that, but uh, as your experience is getting better and better and more and more, it's better for you to be accustomed to the standard English. That's why uh, please use this kind of expressions. Another one, my topic today is about the stand placement. This is okay, or how would you uh, rephrase this sentence? Maybe today I'm going to talk about stand placement. Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah. Today I will talk about the stand placement, or today my topic is a stand place. This is simple. Uh, what about the, this one? Excuse me, would you please go to the microphone? How do you like it? Dr. Seredon, do you like this one? Yes, I, I'm sorry. Actually, the... Um, the, the previous sentence, I read it, but my brain read it in the correct way. I didn't, I didn't pay attention. I guess my eyes mm. didn't see it. So excuse me, would, would you please go to the microphone? Oof. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Would you please go to the mic? Like, could you please speak directly into the microphone or could you please... Uh, um, Okay, my question like this. Uh, when you present, <laughs> there is a, there's a noise I cannot hear. Yes, when 
When you present, yes, please, please explain. Yeah, when you present your scientific paper in a big auditorium, uh, someone or a person asked your question from the audience. So you could not hear what he said because the auditorium was too big. How would you uh, solve the problem? What kind of expression are you going to use, Dr. Seredan? Okay. Maybe I would say, um, could you please repeat it into the microphone? Could you uh, please wait? Pass him a microphone to, with a microphone to the person, you know? I think that would okay. be probably what would be. Okay. When I attended the RSNA for the first time in 1988, an old gentleman asked a question to the speaker who was young with a ponytail. I vividly remember. And then that was a big auditorium. So the speaker with a ponytail used this one. Excuse me, would you please go to the microphone? And then the old gentleman uh, stood up and went to the microphone and repeat his question. I loved how it sounded. Since then, I have used this phrase for 20 years because it was wonderful expression because uh, you can see I was able to think about the answer or have another chance to hear the question clearly. And also another benefit was that it took up at least one minute to go to the microphone and thus I had a few questions to answer. For example, uh, three minutes Usually they ask two questions because when I used this term, it took at least one minute or two minutes for them to go to the microphone. <laughs> That's why I have used this questions uh, because I was afraid of the questions. But a few years ago, one of my friends from the United States said, don't use this one. You are old and well known, so you can use this one. I am sorry, would you please use the microphone? So in the state in San Antonio and many uh, universities, I asked this question. Half of them say, yes, it's okay. But when I said this one, wow, you are right. We should be uh, modest or uh, we have to respect it. That's why I'm sorry. Would you please use the microphone? It is uh, more polite than this one, but uh, I still uh, don't know the uh, nuance, but I use this one. I'm sorry. Would you please use the microphone? But this is an example. So sometimes you cannot understand the question from the audience. When you do not understand the question, how do you solve the problem, Dr. Alfaro? Andrea Alfaro? Yes, maybe I can, um, well, maybe you can also start with, uh, I am sorry, uh, would you repeat your question? Or I'm sorry, I couldn't hear your question. Can you repeat it for me? Okay, good, excellent. So there, here are three examples. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, please try to use, I'm sorry, this is good. I did not understand your question as you mentioned. Would you please rephrase your question or I'm sorry, could you please repeat the question more slowly? Or this is good, Mr. Chairman, if you understood the question, would you please repeat it for me? This is good when you don't understand the questions and then you can, the speaker, no, the person repeat the question. So you, it's not a good idea to ask to repeat it two times or three times, right? In the case you can, this one. What about this? When you cannot understand the, the question at all, uh, so you ask the 
A person who asked the question, would you please repeat the question or would you please rephrase your question? And he or she rephrased the question for you. And then you couldn't understand. And then you asked the chairman, Mr. Chairman, would you please uh, repeat the question because I didn't understand. Even after the repeat by the chairman, you couldn't understand. How would you solve the problem? Dr. Solano or Dr. Montaño from Mexico? No? Or Dr. Seredon? <laughs> I, I remember one time I was in a meeting mm -hmm. and there was a, a person from Argentina who was presenting and a person from Pakistan mm -hmm. uh, asked a question and they both had very, very thick accents. Okay. So the person from Bangladesh or from Pakistan was asking and the presenter said, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you said. And the person repeated the question a second time. And the, uh, then, then he didn't understand. He said, no, I don't understand. And then he repeated it a third time. And no, I'm sorry, I just don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> and that was the end of it. They didn't ask uh, somebody else, another chairman or some third person to, to maybe mm -hmm. to, to translate between them. Uh, I, I did understand what one of them was asking and I could have translated, but they never said, oh, can somebody uh, try to explain or something like that? Maybe, I don't know, maybe that could help. Okay, so uh, this is my tips. Uh, probably you can use one of these three. I'm sorry, it's hard for me to answer your question. And you don't need to use this one because of my poor English, or I'm very sorry, I'm afraid that my English is not good enough to explain, but I like this one. I'm very sorry, I don't understand your question. I will get back to your question after this session. And one guy used this one. So this is a very polite and then positive attitude. Anyway, there are different kinds of methods, but uh, if you want, you can use one of my three tips. And when you do not know the answer, you can understand the question, but you do not know the answer. Here is a two example. Thank you for your excellent question. However, I'm afraid that the answer is beyond my expertise. Unfortunately, there is a question that I do not know the answer to. If you give me your contact information, I would be happy to find the answer for you. This is very polite and good one. So always be internally critical of what you hear, but be externally respectful with your questions. And then I'd like to move on to the fifth topic, pay attention to any unfamiliar sound. Actually, in the beginning, I had difficulties because I couldn't pronounce some uh, consonants or vowels, for particularly Z sound and R sound. So uh, I asked my English teacher and American and British friend to teach me how to pronounce the R sound and also L sound and the Z sound. But the answer was they tried to teach me, but the answer was that I cannot teach you because I naturally learned how to pronounce this one uh, from childhood. So I asked them, please open your mouth so that I can see your tongue. Where is your tongue? But anyway, uh, in July 2000, 11 years after my first lecture in Japan, I met Mr. David Lee as our new English teacher and made this guideline for pronunciation of unfamiliar consonant and vowel. That was wonderful. Uh, for example, here is an example. Uh, Andrea, Dr. Andrea Alfaro, please pronounce this one. Rice, Robert. Uh, is it okay? 
Well, I, I did the exercise myself, all the words uh, you gave us. I okay. repeat all okay. of them at home. <laughs> it was oh. kind of funny. Okay, I said, okay. okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Alfaro, I know that Spanish has this kind of R sound, like uh, uh, Rueda and Pedro, right? So your R sound is different from uh, English R sound, right? Yes. Like what's, the, what's, the, what's the difference? Would you please pronounce this one in Spanish way? As, uh, it would be like Rise Robot. We, we sound like <laughs> You're right. You're right. So uh, that is a typical Spanish word. So uh, this is very important. I will explain what I did to change. Eventually, I changed this one by using this method during your drone. Drone is like a, a mm, or, or like a, a chant or like a dog sound. Mm, and curl your tongue tip up and back so that it points toward the hard palate without touching it and around the lips very slightly. So kissing position. So definitely the R sound is different. So I still uh, have difficulty to pronounce Pedro, but I can make it because I asked many uh, Spanish speakers to teach me how to thrill the tongue. So I know that you touch the mm, hard uh, palate or uh, back and just the tip of the uh, no, soft palate, but in English is different. I will, I will try it, like uh, during your drone, like mm, rice, rob, robot. So here's an example. Rice, rubber, rattle, rodents, wet, paper, wear, really, paper, sleeper, robots, restaurant. So I repeated this one more than uh, 100 times and also repeated it again and again. I, so I made it. And uh, this is uh, time for Dr. Seredon because Dr. Seredon is uh, bilingual. <laughs> Dr. Seredon, uh, please teach us how you can pronounce and please uh, pronounce these uh, vocabularies. <laughs> okay, let me see. Okay, I would say rice, rubber, rattle, rodents, rats, paper, rare, really, and beeper. Okay, um, that's different from Dr. Alfaros. I know that. So please explain. Well, you basically have to close your mouth a little bit, and uh -huh. I think you have to lift your tongue a little bit. I don't think about it, as you mentioned. I don't really, like when I say rice, I... I, I lift my tongue and I take it to the hard palate, but I, I don't touch it that much. But I do like keep the mouth the small, like not very big. It's not, you don't open your mouth very much. You basically make your mouth small. So you say rice. Yeah, that, that, is, uh, that is a kissing position. Small, yeah, yeah, exactly. That means around the top, <laughs> very slightly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you, so, you, you make the, the, mouth, the mouth very, very small, very tight. So rum, mm -hmm. rum. Rubber. So you don't you don't you don't smile when you say it. You don't say sure, right. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. How to moderate a scientific section? Here are three do's. Try to meet all the presenters before the session begins, and remind the presenters of their time limit. This is very important. This is a, a moderate role to finish. Uh, session in time. If you have a crucial question, perhaps essential for clarification, ask it immediately on behalf of the audience. If not, ask the audience for questions. So you can give the opportunity for the audience to ask a question. If there is no questions, you can ask a question to stimulate the discussion. That is very important point. And uh, you remember that uh, I sent you this template to 
know how to moderate a scientific session. Uh, has anyone have moderated a scientific session in English? Dr. Seredon, have you ever moderated a session in English? No, no, I've never moderated a session in uh, an English. No, I've, no. Okay. What about uh, Dr. Alfaro? Uh, I did it once. In fact, I, I did it this year. Uh, okay. But it was my first and uh, unique time. And so, I, I did, well, I did uh, three things. Um, first, of course, I read as much as I could about the topic. Uh -huh. And then I made myself uh, a couple of questions, maybe about six questions. Okay. And I also shared these questions with some colleagues mm -hmm. to check the English. I mean, the grammar, um, well, trying to see if they were interesting or not, if they were easy to understand or not. And the other thing is um, one of the speakers well, was uh, Dr. Well, Dr. Noria Well, who is uh -huh. very known. And so, well, I had the opportunity to meet him uh, about two years ago. So uh, I was already pretty familiar with him. So I okay. tried to find, um, let's say, it, uh, I forgot it. In YouTube, I tried to find as much as uh, records as I could about him explaining topics. So oh, I... Okay. So it was easy, easier for me to get used to his voice. Okay. So, is... Yeah, I think it helped me a lot. So it was pretty easy for me to understand his English. Okay. So thank you very much for sharing your experience. So for you, which one was more difficult or nervous? Presentation in English or moderation in English? Which one was more difficult for you? Uh, I have never made a presentation in ah, English. Ah, you are right. You are no, right. I, I, I only had the opportunity to be, yes, uh, to moderate a, a scientific session. So it was the opposite. Okay, I see. I see. Yes. Thank you. And then uh, we are ready to start first. Everybody moves forward, please. Uh, this is okay, but uh, we are ready to start. First, I want the people sitting while standing at the back of the room to move forward. And also this is an example. I used this one, I still use this one. If you want, you can use this example. I will briefly read it. Could you, uh, could everyone take a seat please? We are ready to start. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Symposium A. I am Ho Young Song from SM Medical Center, Korea, and we will be chairman for this session. Serving with me as a co-chairman is Dr. Adam, professor of the University of Bonn. We have 10 papers. Each presentation will be limited to 12 minutes, including three minutes of discussion. I will chair the first five papers and Professor Adam will chair the second five. Also, here are four expressions to introduce the speakers. I'd like to call on our first speaker, Dr. A from B Hospital, or for examples. Also, three expressions to start the QA session. Uh, this is simple, like uh, are there any questions or comment for Dr. A? Or any questions from the audience or from floor? We have time for the questions. And also one expression to close the session. This is a simple. So you can just read it. And that there is uh, many examples in my template. So finally, I'd like to talk about the importance of building up mentorship and friendship. Remember, this is Excuse also me. On, okay. Uh, can, can I ask you something? Uh, okay, I'll finish one within five minutes, and then I will have a Q&A session. Okay. Okay. Dr. Alfaro is okay. So remember, this is an, uh, also an opportunity for you to form, form network, mentorship, and friendship. Throughout the years, I have forged the strong scientific and personal bond with many enthusiastic scholars. And then I, today, I'd like to briefly uh, introduce four of them. Dr. Taewon Lim from Korea and Dr. Konstantin Kok 
from University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia and the Dr. Uh, David Comp from Colorado University and then the Dr. David Shepherd from the Bomos in the UK. And uh, my paper on transcatheter embolization of traumatic pseudoaneurysm was accepted by RSNA in 1989. I was happy and, and also excited, but I didn't know how to present that in English. So I met Dr. Taewon Nim at the Assam Medical Center who presented two papers at 1988 RSNA conference. So at the time I worked for my alma mater university. So it took for me for six hours to meet uh, Dr. Taewon Nim. He taught me how to design the slides and present in English. After that, I visited Dr. Konstantin Kopp at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia for one month, just before RSNA conference. And I asked him to correct my, revise my presentation and asked him to record in his voice using a tape. And I listened to his uh, tape, tape again and again until it was worn out. That was a wonderful opportunity. And also I observed some experimental studies for one month. And then on Thanksgiving, Dr. Kof invited me and two other doctors to his home. And he cooked turkey because that was Thanksgiving. Just before we start dinner, he asked a question. Dr. Song, do you eat turkey in Korea? I answered. I don't think so, but I saw one at the zoo. He asked me, what is zoo? How do you spell it? I said, Z-O-O. -O. What is Z? Please write down on this paper. I just wrote down Z-O-O. -O. He said, oh, zoo. Um, my face turned red. And I wanted the ground to open up and swallow me. So um, I cannot forget that kind of a situation. Uh, and then all of the mistakes again and again, for example, uh, he asked me, what, uh, what was the cause of death of the rabbit during the experimental study? I replied, he died of breathing, not bleeding. So I didn't know how to pronounce R sound and L sound. And another example. So that was my strong motivation to learn English. So English became an obstacle for me to present, moderate, and give a lecture in English. So I was like a page torn from a book painfully aware, aware of my limitations. I decided to ask my friends, American friend, Dr. David Compey from Colorado University and Dr. David Shepard, coincidentally, their name is David. So I call them David in the UK. And then I asked them to revise my presentations and my emails, here you can see, for the past two years, I emailed them many times to uh, ask revision with the use of a track change function on Microsoft Word so that I could understand what, where they changed. You remember these uh, uh, emails? So here from uh, to us, even in Costa Rica, even now, so I emailed you this uh, one, three weeks ago after their proofreading. So I have learned a lot. And then also I asked them to record my lectures and also 
speeches in their own voice. So this is an example. Dr. Kompi, he is very famous. And he came to Korea for talks at Korean Radiological Society. And also he came to my office to record the Society of Interventional Radiology Gold Medal Award speech in 2016. It was sheer honor and joy for me. Uh, so I listened to uh, his recording again and again to the last minute until my gold medal award speech in front of more than 2,000 SIR members. So in 2004, he invited me to the University of Colorado Health Science Center for 10 days and asked me to give three talks on Monday and uh, Tuesday. After that, he took a vacation and he showed us his second house and also his kid at the very school resort. This is his house. His house is wonderful. And this is his second house. And also, uh, this is me. Uh, and then Dr. Kompi took a picture of me at the bottom of Vales Resort. And also, this is his wife, Rosemary. And this is my wife. So uh, we had a wonderful relationship. Last year, uh, when I stayed in San Antonio, my wife and I drove up to the Colorado from San Antonio for 14 hours. Um, you do use of a land car. So this is Rosemary came to us to greet. And then uh, Rosemary uh, cooked all days. And also we stayed there four days and during the COVID-19 pandemic. So here you can see we were wearing masks. Uh, so I like their garden because the garden is like a botanical garden. So when the time for uh, say goodbye came, we uh, bought an Austrian fine tree to celebrate our 30 years of friendships. Uh, okay, and this is a Dr. David Compey in Bomos in the UK. He invited me to St. George Hospital in London and asked me to give talks on lacrimal balloon dilation and stent placement and live demonstration. They prepared three patients, and then I did the uh, procedures for ophthalmologist and interventional radiologist. And they asked us to stay in their house. We made it. And in 2004, they also he invited me to the UK asking to talk about the gastroduodenal stent placement. In 2007, when I received the British Honorary Fellowship members, he asked me to stay with there in their house. And then we stayed there for four days and they drove, gave us a ride from Bournemouth to the Birmingham for four hours. So the, that was wonderful memory and then pretty experience. So I believe that I am very, it is a good fortune that in my career, my path has intersected with those of my friends and mentors. So they taught me with the patience and helped me build the self-confidence and encouraged me by sharing their unending wisdom promoted the importance of lifelong learning and helped me improve my English. I realized that the number of mentors defines your real success in life. And any place where enthusiastic mentors and mentors uh, is my home. 
I am devoted to the aura and essence of human beings like a butterfly. So that's why I stayed in the United States for two years and I will be staying in uh, China. <laughs> 